Delighted you could join us today for this fascinating program. I'm Wynne Kane, president of the League of Women Voters of Lake Forest, Lake Bluff area. The League is a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse or support any political parties or candidates. The League does advocate and educate about major public policy issues that are important to us, like climate change. We work at national, state, and local level with over 800 chapters across the country. Membership in the League is open to both men and women. We offer a variety of activities throughout the year. Voter registration, candidate debates, public programs, and discussion groups. If you're interested in public issues or in being engaged in the political process, please think about joining us. We would love to have you. There are membership brochures in the lobby, or you can go to our website, www.lwb-lflb.org, to get more information and follow us on Facebook. I also invite you to our annual holiday luncheon on Friday, December 2nd at Froggy's in Highwood. In addition to the wonderful food, Gary Bradford will be giving a presentation about Julia Child, who is a spy and a chef. In January, we're having another public program. This will be about Iran and will be held at Lake Forest College. More information will be on our website. If you would like to support the League's work by making a donation to help offset the cost of these programs, there's a donation jar on the table out of front. We appreciate your help. Today's program is being videotaped, recorded by Lake Forest TV, and will be shown on Channel 17 or 19 in Lake Forest on our website and on YouTube. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our co-moderators this afternoon. Elizabeth Joy Guscott Miller serves as co-vice president of program for our local League of Women Voters, and is an attorney and partner with Guscott Mueller Law, LLC, with offices in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, and in Chicago. A member of the federal trial bar, Joy's general practice is concentrated in business and real estate transactions and litigation as well as employment law and discrimination matters. Our co-moderator, David Miller, also a member of the League and is a participating attorney with Boo Scott Mueller Law Firm. He's practiced environmental law for over 30 years, including CNH Global, a multinational manufacturing company. There he developed and coordinated an international environment compliance and sustainability program. Joy will now introduce our speakers. Joy. Joy Guscott Mueller, and thank you so much for attending today. Uh, I first, before I go any further, I just want to t thank my co-vice presidents of program who served with me in this capacity, Sharon Borg and Carol Gale, the entire board of directors for the League of Women Voters, uh, and also our climate change interest group, which is a newly formed group, which has become a de, a de facto committee, and all of the work that all of you have done to make this a, a success. We appreciate it. And of course, we are uh, delighted to have our speakers, and we are so grateful, and thank you so much. We're delighted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Tom. Uh, we're delighted to have Tom Skilling, WGN-TV meteorolo meteorologist, Douglas Sisterton, uh, Sisterson, research meteorologist with Argonne National Laboratory, and Mary Gavey, former regional administrator with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We look forward to them sharing their insights into potential shifts in climate change policy. As when indicated, post-election analysis, the future of climate change strategy in a new administration is the focus of the panel presentation. And I think we would all agree that to today we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> 
So we would like to thank our, our climate change experts. I'd like to thank co-moderator David Mueller uh, for participating today. Uh, please let your friends and family know that this is going to be broadcast on television. And I, I want to make sure you all know that both women and men, and I see a lot of young people here, uh, can join the league because we all have a role to play in public policy and government. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Tom Skilling. Tom is the nationally renowned chief meteorologist at WGN TV News, which he joined in 1978. He expanded his audience when he became the driving force behind the Chicago Tribune's weather page in 1997. In addition to his media responsibilities, Tom has played an active role in educating the public about climate change. For over 35 years, Skilling has hosted the annual Fermilab Tornado and Severe Storm Seminar in Batavia. Thousands of people of all ages attend to hear leading experts discuss twisters, damaging thunderstorms, and lightning. And before I finish this introduction, I'm realizing I did not make you aware that if you have questions for Tom or any of our panelists, we will have volunteers with note cards and pencils circulating Put your hand up for a card, they'll collect your card from you uh, after you're finished writing your question and we will bring them up and have them read at the end of the program. Tom Skilling yearly speaks about weather and climate change at the United Nations sponsored World Environmental Day hosted by the Chicago Botanic Garden. He has also created many weather specials and award-winning documentaries. Tom has received a multitude of awards, honorary doctorates, and Emmys for ex excellent work in broadcasting and meteorologist, meteorology. And so please join me in providing a warm welcome to our first speaker, Tom Skelly. What a lovely introduction and what a turnout on that Saturday. We were all marveling at this. I must tell you that I've worked with this panel before, and when Elizabeth called me one night, I heard my young producer on the phone with somebody. We were ready to go on the air, and it sounded kind of interesting. I said, Bill, who is that? And he said, oh, it's Elizabeth calling. And uh, he put Elizabeth on the speakerphone, and she uh, talked about uh, plans for this program. Well, little did we think a little thing called an election would go on between uh, that call and today, so never has uh, the subject taken on greater relevance. And I must tell you about my co-panelists here. Uh, Mary Gady is amazing. I couldn't help but look at the smile on Elizabeth's face and think, Mary, uh, the two of you, um, it's like they're surgically implanted. They're so <laughs> small and so uh, I'll tell you, Mary is, uh, is just a joy. I, I met Mary when the city was bidding for the Olympics, and they set up committees and all, and they said, well, we bought, I don't have a weather forecaster a meteorologist on there, and little did I think that in our working group, Mary would be there uh, as they were bidding to the Olympic Committee and hoping that uh, Chicago might be chosen. And Doug uh, has written a book with uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Seth Darling at Argonne. Uh, Doug, you have a Doug, a frontline climate researcher, and he'll tell you more about his work. Um, it's, it's amazing the work that's going on in Argonne. Uh, we media types stand on the shoulders of giants, and it's uh, people like Doug who really do the work uh, and the research areas like climate change. But uh, he's amazing, and uh, he and Seth have uh, co-authored a book called How to Change Minds on Our Changing Climate. It is probably uh, the best read. Uh, if you hear people bring up points uh, criticizing climate science, and we, there's a standard set of points that are often brought up, uh, this book very elegantly addresses them scientifically and, uh, and it gives you a feel for the scientific approach to the issue of climate change. It's a, a wonderful read and a great primer on the subject and I would uh, certainly recommend it. I'm sure Doug will talk some more about it uh, as we go along. But I should tell you, I'm going to speak first and then I have some slides I want to show you that afterwards. So um, I, I hope that works out all right. Uh, what a week this has been uh, to say there's concern in the climate community and beyond in the wake of this week's presidential election would be an understatement, particularly 
And with a candidate who's being reported as the likely as likely to head the effort to revamp the Environmental Protection Agency, an outspoken critic of climate scientists. That person is Myron Ebel. He's the current director of the Center for Energy and Environment and the Cons Conservative uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Ebel was quoted in Vanity Fair uh, in an article as saying, quote, there's been a little bit of warming, uh, but it's been very modest and well within the range of natural variability. And whether it's caused by human beings or not, it's nothing to worry about. Well, uh, that's the line we're likely to hear in the years ahead from the current administration. That plus claims that NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, has drifted from its core mission of space exploration, which is code for NASA should halt its groundbreaking climate change research, from which we learned so much. Uh, what's feared, and not without reason, is that the demonization of climate scientists, uh, science, which has been underway in some quarters for some time, may be about to become official U.S. policy. It's uh, reminiscent of what happened in Australia three years ago when Prime Minister Tony Abbott there took office. Uh, I was told of, uh, during a visit at the Bureau of Meteorology there, I was in Australia three years ago for a wedding, uh, in talking to the office director that uh, I said to him, what do you think of climate change as a working meteorologist here down under and he said, oh, the, the temperatures are doing this, and the rainfall is doing that. And he added that uh, uh, the only person in Australia who didn't think climate change was happening was their prime minister, <laughs> whose first act in office was to dismantle government-funded climate research. Uh, my visit occurred at a time when there were mammoth fires burning in Australia, fueled by heat and drought. Those fires had grown so severe, they had enveloped the country's largest city, Sydney, in a uh, acrid and noxious veil of smoke, uh, so much so that Australian TV networks had gone wall to wall with their coverage of the disaster. Prime Minister Abbott uh, had been infuriated by a United Nations climatologist who dared suggest that the severity of the fires were the product of climate change. He insisted not. Well, far from being uh, having nothing to worry about with regard to climate change, we've got a, a problem, a big problem. Uh, our planet's climate is changing, and it's doing so on a scope and a speed uh, never been observed before. Climate change is not a hoax. It's real, it's well underway, and it's already having a profound effect on this uh, planet's weather and climate. Climate change deniers, a group I'll identify or examine later in my talk, because it's important to know who these folks are and how unreliable some of the information they espouse is. Uh, their arguments go something like this, we've always had climate change, there's nothing new about this, it's all cyclical and within the range of natural variability. They then add, quit being chicken littles and claiming there's something unusual about this, there's nothing to worry about, you media types are doing this for ratings, and researchers are crying wolf to corner huge research grants. Wow. Uh, I mean, that, you don't know where to begin with something like that, it's off the charts, but that's the line. Um, those who take this line deserve to be called out, and called out big time. Next time you hear that, think about this. The planetary surge in temperatures over the past century has been occurring at ten times the speed of anything observed on this planet. Well, we have reliable proxy records on the planet's temperature trend going back millions of years. It is well outside the range of natural variability. And unlike past climate changes, uh, the, the majority of shifts in weather and climate were driven in those by changes in our orbit about the sun and the uh, planet's wobble on its axis. What meteorologists and uh, climatologists and uh, astronomers refer to as Milankovitch uh, cycles. What's happening now is quite different. Milankovitch cycles have driven the vast majorities of our big ice ages in the past, and they occur on time scales of tens of thousands of years. In stark contrast, the current changes are being driven by dramatic and human-induced chart changes in atmospheric chemistry and are occurring in a comparative fraction of the time uh, that these Milankovitch changes take place. Uh, humans, since the beginning of the planet's industrial uh, revolution, have been able to effect huge changes in the proportion of key gases which hold on to and re-radiate heat in our atmosphere. Where pre-industrial carbon dioxide levels back in the late 1700s and early 1800s came in at about 280 parts per million, 
Current CO2 levels are nearly 150% higher, 400 parts per million. And were the oceans not at least up to this point in time absorbing vast amounts of CO2, and we don't know at what point that will stop, and they'll heat up to the point they start yielding stored carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. Were they not absorbing, uh, absorbing the CO2, the levels of carbon dioxide would be 500 parts per million, which is absolutely unprecedented. As it is, this planet's atmosphere has seen nothing like today's levels in CO2 in nearly 800,000 years. Now, such a statement isn't just a stab in the dark, which uh, those who question climate science would suggest. Bubbles of air trapped in Arctic cores have been meticulously analyzed by scientists who can then tell how carbon dioxide levels have changed from the past. And we know the added carbon dioxide is from fossil fuels, not from natural sources, because CO2 produced from burning fossil fuels is chemically tagged. There are particular isotopes of carbon which give away the carbon dioxide's origin enabling scientists to differentiate uh, from naturally produced carbon dioxide and that produced by humans. It's also worth debunking claims that the change in our climate is somehow related to a change in the output of the sun. The fact is, uh, solar output has actually dropped during the period of maximum heating. So the sun is not the factor here. The effects of climate change have already been stunning around the planet. Uh, nowhere has that been truer than in our planet's Arctic regions uh, a region whose warming is like a canary in the coal mine, a sign of things going on on our planet. Warming in the polar regions has been going on at twice or more the speed of uh, warming in other places in the, uh, on the planet. The impact there has been nothing short of breathtaking. Our Arctic regions are undergoing a meltdown of historic proportions. One trillion tons of ice are estimated to have melted in Greenland alone in just the three years from 2011 to 2014. Nine trillion tons of ice has melted there in the past century. Uh, the meltwater which has resulted is enough to submerge this country's entire interstate highway system beneath 98 feet of water and to do it 63 times over. If all of Greenland's ice were to melt, sea level would rise 20 feet uh, from the meltwater alone. And the ice isn't just melting in Greenland. Alaska's glaciers have lost 330 trillion tons of ice since 1994, and ice disappears there at the rate of 75 billion tons per year. And in the southern hemisphere, Antarctica's ice is in what's referred to as an unstoppable state of melting now, which could add another four feet of water to sea level before the century's end, and maybe as much as 10 feet. And by the way, deniers like to point to record sea ice, which has built up in the last several years around Antarctica. Uh, this they improperly claim is proof that planetary warming isn't occurring. This is totally misleading, and it's not at all what's happening down there. The truth is that sea ice is different from land-based ice, which we know is melting even in Antarctica. The uh, sea ice has no effect for all intents and purposes on sea level. It's different than the land ice that's melting, which holds most of the water in the Arctic regions of this planet, uh, for several reasons. Uh, there are several reasons that sea ice has accumulated. None of them indicating planetary warming isn't happening. In fact, the sea ice buildup in Antarctica uh, is actually a sign that warming is occurring and maybe the product of uh, climate change uh, globally. Fresh water from the melting ice has less salt in it than seawater does and is therefore less dense. It therefore floats on the ocean surface. Uh, because it's less salty, the water freezes at higher temperatures and more extensively than salt water. Uh, we know that in the winter because we put salt on the highway and the idea there on our roads is to increase the salt content of the water, which will drop the freezing level and therefore um, uh, help it uh, melt more quickly and stay melting. Uh, the increased water from melting ice in Antarctica and the fact that storms have grown more frequent and stronger as the air surrounding that continent has um, have increased uh, leads to winds that have increased in that region as well. And this piles up the ice, allowing it to build in coverage in the cold. So to say that ice buildup around Antarctica disproves uh, the notion of the planet is warming is misleading and frankly shows a lack of understanding of the complex processes which dictate sea ice uh, formation. Uh, here is my ice wash in the Arctic. Some people may say, well, who cares that the Arctic is melting? 
Here's why ice melting in the Arctic is critical. It affects the way the atmosphere there heats. Also, the amount of open ocean that can feed moisture into the atmosphere. This can affect snowfall there, but it also affects where jet streams form, the critical steerers of weather system uh, on Earth. Some scientists believe that the melting of the Arctic and the warming that's going on there is leading to wavier jet streams. Uh, wavy jet streams contribute to extremes in temperature and precipitation by setting up what we call blocking patterns, which alter the speed and direction in which weather systems move. Uh, blocking patterns can affect the period of time in which extremes of temperature and precipitation linger over an area. Such a blocking pattern steered Hurricane Sandy into the East Coast, allowing it to follow, uh, not allowing it to follow the climatologically favored track, which would have taken it out to sea. Blocking has contributed to California's record drought and to the record snowstorms in New England in recent winters. Now, while some of our politicians and pundits quibble over whether climate change is real, the Pentagon, with 555,000 facilities on 28 million acres of land globally, sees climate change impacts firsthand and plans for even graver impacts in the decades to come. Naval facilities in Norfolk, Virginia, for instance, are not only dealing with sinking ground there, but with rising sea levels at twice the global average thanks to the Arctic ice melt. The Navy base in Norfolk is submerged with increasing frequency as ocean levels rise. Rolling Stone reports that many naval officials feel it's a real possibility that the base in Norfolk may sink into the Atlantic within the lifetime of young people born on the base there. This could also be the fate of some of the planet's largest cities, homes to hundreds of millions of people. The Pentagon's concerns extend beyond sea level rise. The conflicts which are likely to arise as Arctic-based countries vie for access and control over shipping lanes there, as well as the research grab that's likely to go on in the Arctic, uh, means there'll be some more uh, confrontations in the Arctic that we may have to worry about. Google, uh, just for fun, Syria and climate change. Let me explain. Climate scientists were warning as early as 1990 of the potential impacts of climate change on human migration across the pattern of the planet. That we're seeing such a migration in Europe as victims of the war in Syria seek to escape the war-torn region. It turns out that the Middle East's four worst droughts on record there seriously impacted Syria and the Middle East before the conflict began or the current war. This drought forced 1.5 million rural residents in Syria from failing farms into already heavily populated cities which lacked the means or infrastructure to handle this influx of civilization. Climate change didn't directly cause the problems or the horrific war which has occurred there, but it was almost certainly among the, most, uh, the host of factors that helped destabilize that region, a situation which men well played into, played into the hands of groups like ISIS. And just this past summer, many areas in the Middle East logged historic heat. Temperatures surged higher than ever before. Baghdad was among the cities reporting all-time highs. They recorded a temperature of 127 degrees. Imagine living in that. Um, Secretary of State John Kerry, speaking about the migrations, says, uh, wait until you see what happens when there's a lack of water, the absence of food, and one tribe fighting another for survival. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia are among the regions which may prove most vulnerable to such instability, a fact which was first laid out in 19, the 1990 report from the Intergovernmental Inter uh, Panel on Climate Change, the so-called IPCC of the United Nations, whose regular reports call the expertise of scientists from multiple disciplines across the world. But while climate change first and most cruelly savages the planet's most vulnerable and least privileged, no one is immune. The last time we had global temperatures that finished below normal in a single month was 40 years ago in 1976. Our country has spent $357 billion in the past decade cleaning up after weather disasters, $1.1 trillion to handle the $200 billion plus disasters since 1988 alone, everything from wildfires to drought, extreme heat, large tornado outbreaks. By the way, there have been fewer actual tornadoes, but studies have shown the tornadoes that are occurring are occurring in clusters which tend to be more damaging and deadly. Tropical cyclones uh, are included there too, fewer hurricanes and typhoons, 
but the ones that are occurring are stronger, and it's been the contention of climate scientists right along that that's what the models show. There'll be fewer hurricanes and typhoons, but the ones that form will be stronger. Not uh, just one, but nine separate 500 to 1,000 year floods have ravaged sections of this country in the past year alone. Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, the Carolinas, and West Virginia have been among the areas affected and widely covered in the media. The planet's warming atmosphere holds more water and extreme precipitation events are growing more frequent. Studies have shown that the percent of precipitation or rainfall and from extreme weather events is up 37% across the Midwest, up 71% in New England since 1958. If you doubt that, ask anyone in this area who lives along the Des Plaines or any of our other rivers. They'll tell you that flooding has occurred with a frequency which is beyond anything we've experienced before. 65% of Miami realtors profess concern about the impact of sea level rise. And in the wake of, uh, in the wake of uh, devastating Superstorm Sandy, New York has commissioned studies on building a mammoth seawall which would surround the southern half of Manhattan Island. The stunning $10 billion price tag on that might only be a down payment on what's required to ultimately, in what may ultimately be a losing battle to protect that city and others from uh, the frightening vulnerability to sea level rise. Forecasts are the current 8 to 10 inches of sea level rise could be dwarfed by 3 feet or more uh, by the end of the century and possibly as much as 10 feet. And uh, Hurricane Sandy flooded 88,000 buildings. Next time you fly into New York, look at what's going on below. The water comes right up to populated areas and in many cases just a few feet above sea level. Heat waves like the one that produced more than 700 deaths here in 1995. 50,000 deaths in Europe in 2003, 665 deaths and 16,000 hospital visits in California during extreme heat in 2006, and another 50,000 deaths in Eastern Europe and Western Russia in 2010, plus the deaths in recent years in India and Pakistan and record high are also on the increase. Heat in Australia in 2014 produced that country's highest temperature readings and even Antarctica reported a record high of 62 degrees on one of its islands. So climate change is certainly one of the, if not the issue of our time. Uh, you know, researchers like a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Dr. Don Wobbles of the University of Illinois, a Nobel Prize winning climate researcher, uh, simply says this is one of these stories for which there's not another side to it. And to have 97% of an inherently skeptical group like climate scientists on board with the notion the planet is warming, speaks to the level of uncertainty on the issue. And it isn't just the atmosphere which is warming. Oceans cover 70% of our planet and interact with the atmosphere above them. It's that warmth which fuels the planet's tropical cyclones, the hurricanes and typhoons. Uh, they haven't been increasing in numbers, as I pointed out, but their intensity has been going up. But what has been happening, uh, besides these uh, storms increasing, is that ocean temperatures have soared in the past 30 years. It's estimated that the heating of the oceans on this planet in that 30 year period would be like setting off a Hiroshima sized atomic bomb every second over that 30 year period since then. Uh, it's amazing, our oceans are absorbing carbon dioxide and growing more acidic in the process. Today's oceans are 30% more acidic than pre-industrial times back in the late 1700s and 1800s. The process of acidification is occurring at a rate 50 times faster than any that we know has occurred on the planet over the period we can identify. Allowed to continue by the end of this century, the acidity of our planet's oceans will be higher than at any time in the past 100 million years. The process um, and heating uh, is decimating the planet's coral, which is home to many numerous species but more importantly, may have profound impacts on uh, phytoplankton, which is the core of food for smaller fish, which in turn are eaten by larger fish and which we eat. So uh, this uh, threatens this acidification, which is a sidebar to the climate change, but very much a part of it uh, issue, may disrupt the planet's food chain. So with this veritable mountain of scientific evidence, how is it that some continue to insist climate change is a non-issue? We have a senator, Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma, throwing a snowball on the Senate floor, apparently of the erroneous belief that a snowstorm in Washington, D.C. in winter debunks the notion the planet is warming. 
He and his family even built an igloo during an ice storm in Washington years before. The first point to make here is that the senator needs a thorough basic climatology course. He doesn't know the difference between weather, and uh, which is the instantaneous short-term face of the atmosphere, and climate, which refers to weather averaged over a significant period of time. That's pretty basic stuff. But it seems to be common knowledge. Um, it, it does not seem to be common knowledge among the denier class. The second point is that it can still snow in the atmosphere, which is undergoing vigorous global warming. It can also get cold. And it, what happens is there's decreased coverage of the snow. And the snows may even get more severe because the air mass around the storm systems that produce it has more water in it because of the warming. But uh, you know, during the last ice age, there were huge regions of this planet, the tropics, for instance, which were hot and snow-free just as they are today. It was just more that more of the planet in that period was regularly in the grip of cold weather than warm just as it is the case today that more of the planet is in the grip of warm weather than cold. Uh, because the warmer atmosphere fueling winter storms holds more moisture in a period of global warming, you get heavier snows. Long-term climate change researcher at, at NASA and now a Columbia University professor, Dr. James Hansen, told me during an appearance at Benedictine University several months ago that he thinks the record snows so widely covered over New England in recent years are directly the result of climate change. The examples of what he calls superstorms, which are likely, he thinks, to develop more frequently as meltwater from Greenland cools the North Atlantic, which is what's been going on, setting up huge temperature spreads across the planet, which otherwise is being warmed as uh, carbon dioxide that holds on to and re-radiates uh, heat builds up. Sounds like the senators and the manner in which the story of climate change is covered in our mass media may help explain why Americans lag other advanced countries in assessing the severity of the impact of climate change. We've just been through a presidential campaign in which the subject was addressed by only one party, and then only briefly. Uh, the majority of the other party's candidates denied the existence of climate change. They refer to it as a hoax. Still others insist that the discredited notion that planetary warming halted 18 years ago using error-prone satellite-inferred ground-level temperature readings Readings which studies indicate skew cold because the sensors looking down from space must peer through ice crystals and water droplets in the upper atmosphere, which biases them cold. And also because the orbit of these satellites decays, as all satellites' orbits do, and that must be corrected for, or else you bias cold on the reading you're taking in the lower atmosphere. Pew Research has looked at the attitudes on climate change here and globally. It's ironic that the world's greatest air polluter the country which has surpassed us in generating greenhouse gases, China, is home to a population which has one of the lowest numbers of residents who view climate change as a major problem. Only 18% of the Chinese view climate change with major concern. And in the United States, despite the fact we remain one of the world's most prolific uh, polluters, only 45% respond to the climate change as a major problem. And even fewer, just 30% of those surveyed said they expected climate change ever to affect them. By comparison, 74% of those in Latin America, 61% in Africa, 54% in Europe, but just 45% Asia Pacific region and 38% of the Middle East view climate change as a serious problem. For many years, one of the issues has been that uh, scientists wouldn't attach to specific extreme weather events. Climate change is one of the contributing causes. That's changing. The science has advanced. The World Meteorological Organization, known by the acronym WMO, um, uh, has started a, what they call a World Weather Attribution Project to look at these extreme heat waves and storms and all and figure out whether our changing climate had any role in producing them. Scientists now review these extreme events, and they feel comfortable in indicating many of them do have a climate change um, linkage. Studies have shown, too, that personal experience with extreme weather fades after about three years after about three months. And so uh, people may initially be open to the notion that there's something unusual going on, but then that fades as time continues along. So what have we found about the climate deniers, folks who, who question this? The group criticizing climate scientists is a vocal group making noise far beyond their numbers, the over majority of whom, uh, overwhelming majority, possess no climate science background. 
Social media has given critics of climate change an incredible platform from which to criticize the science. And lacking any means of assessing the level of education or expertise of those who post on social media, we literally have a situation in which a Nobel Prize winning scientist has the same standing on social media as an ill-informed person with a political agenda. It's a vicious cycle that feeds on itself. Politicians, talk show hosts, and bloggers, many with little or no background in science or climate science, proclaim climate change a hoax and put forth a series of cherry-picked facts, often used out of context from so-called experts, many of whom have no climate training either. Here's another attack that's used by detractors of climate change science. A letter was signed by 49 NASA employees and sent to NASA management suggesting that that agency's insistence on human activity playing a role in climate change was just plain wrong. The letter claimed human involvement with climate change was without basis and that NASA management was ill-informed in claiming it was. NASA scientists have been among the clearest in laying out the evidence for planetary warming and the threat it proposes. So this letter was immediately and enthusiastically picked up by groups who debunked global warming and climate science. What the coverage of this letter didn't reveal was that not one of the 49 NASA employees who authored it had anything close to a climate science background. It would be like a seismologist or a geologist telling a heart surgeon that he or she had misperformed a heart surgery procedure. Or how about the erroneous claim that climate scientists had as a group predicted global cooling and the onset of an ice age back in the 1970s in mass, when a single Newsweek article, not a huge number of climate scientists, had noted cooling, which had indeed commenced in the 1940s and ran through the 1970s, in a series, and it led to a series of severe winters in the 1970s. The much ballyhooed forecast of planetary cooling then was isolated to that article and a very small group of scientists whose views could only be accurately characterized as outliers. Here's another one. Crime climate scientists, or critics of them, have often used a ploy where we're told they collected signatures of 31,487 scientists on petitions questioning human involvement in climate change. Studies of who these 31,487 alleged scientists really are have found that only one-tenth of one percent of them are actually climate scientists or have any atmospheric science background. And with 20.5 20, 20 million US citizens in possession of a bachelor's of science degree, the 31,387 scientists critical of climate scientists who have allegedly rebutted the notion that climate change is occurring and that humans are playing a role amounts to 15 tenths of 1% of all science degree holders in the United States. And even the number 31,487 turns out to be questionable because a review of the petition allegedly signed by these folks indicates that uh, there were names like Charles Darwin on it, <laughs> since been dead, as well as the Spice Girls members and Star Wars films characters. Media coverage of the climate change subject, suggesting there's more than one side to the story, has added to the misconception that there's a weakness in the science. The fact is, the planet is warming, and doing so at a speed never before observed uh, is one of the uh, handful of stories for which there really isn't a, another side. The space and time devoted to those who have opposing views is completely out of proportion to their numbers. An article on the triple in, from the Triple Helix Science website, co-authored by Cameron Davis, amounted to a fascinating analysis of the media's coverage of climate change and also focused on climate deniers, their motivations and beliefs. This is important because what folks read and hear from talking heads on the media and those put forth in the media as experts often shape the public's view on the subject. And in covering climate change by suggesting there's more than one side of the climate change story, that's a misrepresentation all by itself. Cameron cited 25 different sources for his article, which revealed that while only a tiny group of climate scientists, about 3% of them, question human involvement in climate change and the fact that climate change is occurring at all, the vast majority, 97% of them, do not. The studies indicate humans' role uh, in climate change was questioned, as a, one example, by 33% of the scientists who were aired on CNBC. Now that's, a, that's a total more than 10 times the number of scientists which hold such a view. 
50% of the so-called experts cited by the Wall Street Journal denying a human role in climate change. Um, there were 50% of the so-called experts addressing the subject of climate change, the climate change in the Wall Street Journal who denied it was going on. And 69% of those who appeared on Fox News disassociated climate change with human activities. Even the comparatively liberal Los Angeles Times and other major newspapers granted space 28% of the time to scientists who questioned the human's role in climate change, a number nearly 10 times the 3% of scientists who are experts on the subject. Program hosts of radio and television talk shows who literally have no climate science training and background are among the most vocal critics of the science. The Rush Limbaugh's, the Sean Hannity's, the Lou Dobbs, and the Drudges of the world. These folks communicate a level of uncertainty in the science to readers and viewers which simply doesn't exist. Once politics and age, more than educational background or income, have been found by Pew and Gallup to most accurately reflect the, your likely take on ch climate change. 56% of Democrats view climate change as a major threat, while just 29% of independents do, and 16% of Republicans, and just 9% of Tea Party members consider it a threat. Uh, young Americans, 70% of them between ages 18 and 29, view climate change as a major threat, versus just 50% of 50 to 64 year olds, and 46% of those 65 and older. So as an operational forecaster who's immersed himself in day-to-day -day weather as part of my work for nearly half a century now, my clients and I, and my colleagues and I, have had a front row seat to an atmosphere doing things we haven't seen it do before. I think in terms of the build-up of these warm pools in the Arctic that buckles the jet. But they can even bring unseasonable cold down in winter, and then you're asked, how can there be global warming when it's cold outside, you know, in my neighborhood? Well, you've got to stand back and look at the whole picture. Often we're one little tiny area. That was the case a couple of winters ago. <laughs> the rest of the planet is largely above normal. And I'll show you a map here coming up on uh, uh, global temperatures, how much is above normal and how much is below. It's quite interesting. Uh, most notable are the critically important wavy or amplified jet stream patterns that I see with a frequency I can't remember seeing in the past. That these wavy jet streams, in other words, jet streams that do this, you know, they arc way up into the Arctic and then they come way down into the low and mid latitudes. Um, Jennifer Francis, Dr. Jennifer Francis at Rutgers has been talking about this among others. There's still a discussion about that, but it, it, it's an interesting line of research that's going on. And one other thing to point out, we live on a planet now that has a population that it's never had before. We are therefore more vulnerable to extreme weather changes than ever before. We have 7.5 billion people inhabiting the Earth, the point that ought to be made to those who say we've had climate change before and we've gotten through just fine. We, we haven't had the numbers of people uh, on this planet before who are dependent on food production and, and uh, the, the production of extremes of weather. Um, now some, some pictures up here and uh, some slides just to illustrate this. This is kind of an interesting map. It shows uh, which parts of the world view climate change uh, as serious. We're, we, we fall in this range, 40 to 50 percent. Um, you see Southeast Asia, um, relatively low threat, 20 percent or less. After, on the other hand, South America, folks there, uh, up to 80 percent of the whole population sees it as serious. This next slide shows you the percent of different regions that view climate change as uh, serious, a serious issue. We're at 45 percent. China's at 18 percent. <laughs> the very the statistic on the right column that shows the number of people in these regions that think they'll be directly affected by climate change is 30 percent here in the United States and 15 in China. Now this is a map of where we are so far this year. This is a plot of what part of the planet's been warmer than normal and what part's been cooler than normal. Note the Arctic regions. Uh, because that area is warming up incredibly fast. I go to Alaska, I'm going since 1980. It's amazing what's going on even in that short period of time up there. The blue areas are the areas below normal, and my read on that is that there are far more above normal areas than below normal. Uh, let's go ahead on this. Uh, here are ocean temperatures. Uh, again, the orange and red areas are the areas where the oceans are warmer than average. You can see we have a La Nina going right along the equatorial Pacific. The blue area from South America westward is in progress uh, right there. It's kind of a modest La Nina, cooling of the equatorial Pacific. But things like that actually affect the weather around the rest of the planet. 
Look, by the way, off Greenland. Uh, no, that's all right. Uh, Nancy, no problem. Uh, I talked about the meltwater. The entire North Atlantic has literally been cooled. Yeah. Um, note the cool pool of water right there. That's from the ice melting on Greenland. It's cooled the entire surface uh, of the North Atlantic. It might have profound effects on the weather in New England in the short term. And it's this sort of cooling that may lead to huge temperature spreads across the planet that set up these superstorms that uh, Jim Hansen is talking about. Uh, go ahead. This is where the billion dollar weather disasters have occurred. The brighter reds are states that have seen more disasters as a result of these, uh, or more of these billion dollar weather disasters, many of them with a climate change connection, even if an indirect one. Go ahead. Um, here's the planet. This is uh, the hottest year so far to date. And again, you'll see the cooling up in the North Atlantic over that cool water, but much of the planet is warmer than it has been compared to the uh, 20th century average, what's being looked at there. Go ahead. Um, oh, this is interesting. Now, we talk about the melting of the Arctic. The bright white areas are where there's what's called old ice. Uh, this is where the ice survives the summer season because the sun's up 24 hours a day up there in summer. And the land masses actually heat up. Interior Alaska can get up to 90 degrees in the summer. They have little bubble up afternoon thunderstorms in northern North America and uh, Alaska, much like we do in Florida, because of the long days and the heating of what's called the boundary layer in the atmosphere. But look at the amount of old ice that survives. The white is the old ice. This next one shows the uh, current situation. That was uh, just recently. The, the melting that's going on in the Arctic is, is stunning. Go ahead. Uh, oh, there we go. Thanks, Nancy. Here's uh, in, uh, Greenland. You can see a plot of the ice melt. By the way, you'll notice it doesn't occur linearly, nor do temperature uh, increases on the planet. Um, there are, it, it, the atmosphere warms and fits and starts, and the ice melts and fits and starts, too. In 2012, the Denier Group came out and said, that's it. Anthropogenic warming is over. Uh, it's not going to happen anymore. Human-induced warming. That's because uh, in 2013, there was a slowdown in the amount of melting. It still melted the ice over the Arctic. It just didn't melt as fast as the year before. And it was one of those little temporary downturns right there that was misinterpreted as a large scale, long term trend. Uh, go ahead, Mary. Here's the Muir Glacier in Alaska, and this is being repeated around the planet. Uh, that's 1946 on the left frame. I think the next one was like 64, and the next one is the current one. That whole valley is emptied out. That's a scene that's repeated over and over again in the Arctic regions. And you know, Hansen makes the point, and it is true, it took eons for this ice to develop. Once it's gone, it doesn't come back with a snowy winter. It's gone. And this radically changes the way the planet heats up and its jet streams blow. Here's the uh, global temperature, land and ocean data right there. Uh, and you see the up. It's been warming very quickly since 1960. Go ahead. There is the ocean temperature increase right there since 1880. Here, one thing, we're getting some benefits from it. The frost-free period is longer. So uh, we have 63 more days between the first and last, or the, the, the last and first frosts uh, each year. The, the first and last frost is right the first time. OK. There's sea level, which some contend isn't rising. It is. A friend of mine is Louis Uccellini, who's the head of the Weather Service. He lives out in Maryland. He says the number of days in which there's flooding on the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River uh, have increased dramatically. All right. Uh, there's a little island. This is what, uh, this used to be the case in ice. This is an island off Alaska. And that little native village right there, these have been collapsing into the ocean because this area used to be shrouded by ice. The ice is gone. And so the wave action can eat away at the landmass. And uh, these little communities are collapsing into the water. So they're trying to move people uh, to higher ground. There, oh, this is interesting. This is one of Donald Trump's uh, golf courses. Yes. Uh, and it's estimated here that he, he applied, by the way, for the right to build a wall around it. Uh, because it turns out that uh, 100 meters of uh, that shoreline will disappear underwater as sea level rises. It's also interesting to note that News Corp, the uh, parent company of uh, Fox Channel, 
uh, in its long-range financial papers indicated that they expect troubles with earnings in the 1930s uh, or the uh, 2030s. And they say the reason for that will be they're anticipating electricity disruptions because of the increased air conditioning because of warming that's gone on. So the parent companies get it in many cases, even though their entities may not. But I, just, that's kind of, I thought that was kind of interesting. Here is uh, the wall they're proposing building around New York. They saw the price tag and <laughs> it not, it's not moving forward right now. <laughs> but uh, $10 billion, we'll have to do that uh, around, I mean, think of the cities, uh, London, uh, just go through the list, Miami, New Orleans, um, as, as sea level rises. Uh, onshore wind and Hurricane Sandy flooded the entire New York's, or a good part of the New York subway system. As, and you can see how that whole area, the population is right up to the water. Um, so it's extremely vulnerable to changes in sea level. All right. There's the wall, that's uh, a little more specific look. They, they were going to build it in such a way that you could bicycle on it and jog on it. It was going to be kind of hidden from sight. But again, the price tag was pretty astronomical. I, I'm not sure what the future of that is now. Um, here are the sea level rises at various communities around uh, uh, the ocean. All of them show a sea level rise, some more than others. There have been actually some drops. A lot has to do with prevailing winds in areas. So sea level is not always even. But it can be measured quite precisely from satellites right now. Uh, there is a look at uh, Norfolk, Virginia, where the uh, Navy has one of its bases during one of these flood situations. This was uh, photographed by photographers, Nate First Class, uh, Michael Pendergrass right there. They're having some real problems. And there's New York during Hurricane Sandy, the uh, portion of the city that was submerged in high water. Uh, this is snow being uh, put into a, into a, onto a train, which is going to haul it down to uh, Anchorage, Alaska for the Iditarod. Uh, there's been no snow for the Iditarod race in the last several years. So they've been shoveling snow up farther north if they can find it up there and putting it into trains and trucking tr tr it down so they can start the race in Anchorage in March. Um, there's a, this is what they call a king tide. These are happening more and more. This is Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, you can see that's a sunny day. But the winds are blowing the wrong way, and it might have been a storm offshore, so the high tides are higher, and they come up. And if you marry that to an astronomical high tide, you really have some trouble. Um, and uh, here's a, th this is from the California uh, folks. Even though they had some rains in the mountains, uh, look at the snowpack here on uh, these two satellites, and the next one, uh, Nancy. Uh, 2010, see how the Sierra are loaded with snow, and 2015, a fraction of it. They had some this winter, but they're still dry in Southern California. Didn't, the record El Nino didn't affect it. This is how much of each region's rain is being delivered by extreme rain events, not just your standard rains. And the extreme rain events are defined as the heaviest 10% of rains that occur in the course of the year. So we're up 37% in the Midwest. This dovetails with the notion that we see the dew point, the mean dew point at Midway Airport has increased since the 1970s. Uh, now, just a whole series of, of cities here. This is a year-long plot of temperatures in all corners of the world. I tried to get a range. So, Nancy, that's Chicago. Everywhere you see red on that graph, the temperature was warmer than normal. There's uh, Chicago again. Go ahead, Nancy. That is Barrow, Alaska. Notice there are only a few little periods of the year where they're below normal anymore. There's Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, go ahead, Nancy. Miami, Florida. Uh, there's LaGuardia Airport in New York. Uh, there's the temperature in Yellow Knife, Canada, uh, above normal. Here's uh, Palm Inlet, this up in Baffin Island in far northern Canada, way above normal. Uh, here's Ireland, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, they had a little downturn there, what, February through April last year, but it's been above normal since then. Uh, here is uh, Dijon, France, in central France. Couldn't find Paris, I just thought uh, so Dijon was close to that. Um, here is uh, Hamburg, Germany. Um, go ahead. Here is uh, Switzerland. Uh, Geneva, Switzerland. There is uh, Italy, uh, above normal. Um, here is Norway, up in Scandinavia. Uh, there are the temperatures in Madrid, Spain. Uh, there they are in Argentina, down in the southern hemisphere, the southern end of the South America. Uh, here are the temperatures in Greece. Uh, here are the temperatures in the last year. Uh, that's Switzerland again. Uh, there's Australia. 
uh, Sydney, Australia, the biggest city in the earth. Uh, there's uh, the Mariana Islands, Guam. Uh, there's Australia again. But the point is, you can get, I try to get Beijing and all in there too. If you, Beijing would show the same thing, so would Moscow. So it doesn't matter where you go on the planet, if you look at a graph of the temperatures uh, in just the last year, they're up. And uh, so, you know, this is not imaginary. Um, it, it really is going on. And uh, it'll become more and more serious if we start changing storm tracks and deliver rains and all and support our agricultural region. So that's all I have to say. I don't have to <laughs> it, it's a fascinating subject. And by the way, there's no reason. You can go online. There is incredible material from the solid scientific outfits, not some a blog that has a political agenda. People write me when I, whenever I mention climate change, they say you're in bed with Al Gore. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I drunk the Kool-Aid. Those are the common things. And they're not watching me anymore because I dare to say the climate's warming. But, uh, you know, I look, the beauty of being 64 years old at this point, if I was a young person starting out my career, then I'd have to muzzle myself. I guess it'd be quiet. But uh, this is going on. It's real stuff. And uh, I think it's important that the American public see that. Never more so than now. Because we apparently are on the precipice of getting folks in there who are shooting this stuff down and don't believe it's, it's true. And I think we better be aware of the fact there is a problem. And I'm not sure, you know, even Hansen, uh, James Hansen says, there'll be a tipping point. At some point, the atmosphere gets so out of whack that it starts driving on its own. And there's no pullback at that point. I had a professor at college who said climate change happens, boom, like that. And you often don't know it's happened until you retrospectively look back and say, aha. That was the moment that the farmers in this area couldn't produce wheat anymore. This happened out in the Plain States. Many farmers would then plant the next year after the drought hit, and plant a year after that and lose another crop, and eventually they go bankrupt and have to move. There's what's called a climatic lag on all these things. It doesn't happen right away. And so uh, my professor said at the time, and I hadn't really thought about that, that uh, uh, the reaction to uh, these changes uh, often takes a while to sink in. But um, it's worth looking at the data. Anyway, that's it. I'm <laughs>
Um, Doug's educational efforts were recognized with the University of Chicago Pinnacle of Education Award in 2012. He has authored more than 100 research papers and published reports. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Doug Sisterson. Thank you very much, Tom. I, his, his wealth of information uh, is, is, is amazing. It's uh, a real privilege for the scientific community to have uh, such a renowned meteorologist and TV spokesperson really have a grasp of what you just heard. Um, and, and what I'm going to do, Tom didn't know this necessarily, but I, I, I'm going to shorten my talk and I'm going to give you a five minute video. So it's movie time. Um, I did this as a promo for a presentation I made at the University of Chicago, and I think you'll hear many of the things that Tom just, uh, we weren't colluding on this one at all, but, uh, but Tom hasn't even seen it yet. So um, it was made about two years ago, um, but it's still very relevant to today. So uh, Nancy, I, I'd say let's take a, about a minute right here and get a video. <laughs> energy from the sun and then it returns all that energy in the form of heat back to space at night and so if we lost all the energy we got from the sun during the night time the temperature of the earth easy to calculate would meet zero degrees Fahrenheit but because we have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that slows down the release of the heat at night and it traps it like a thermal blanket so that all of the heat that we got during the day is released and because we have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, we're able to maintain sort of a balmy 60, 61 degrees Fahrenheit global average temperature. But the real kicker for all of this is that the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is only 0.05% represented by mass. Only 0.05% of greenhouse gases is the difference between zero and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it shouldn't be lost to the general public that a small increase in greenhouse gases can have a huge effect on our planet's global temperature. The problem that we have wrapping our brains around global warming or climate disruption is that it doesn't have a, a physical face. You can see a hurricane, you can see tornadoes, you can see hail damage, you can see straight line wind damage, you can see the physical representation of the thing that's about to get you. But with climate change, it's invisible. It's something that's causing something else to happen. So when we have all these issues about not being able to create a monster that we can attribute climate change to and then focus in on that, on how we're going to fix it, it almost makes it unfathomable to the public. For example, we had a huge cold outbreak in November and a lot of people say, well, where's your global warming now? But it turns out because the Pacific Ocean was much above normal in its, in its temperature, it actually fed a typhoon with energy that allowed it to sustain itself and move further northward than we've ever seen before. It got all the way up into the Alaska region and it actually caused the jet stream to buckle. It, it pushed against the normal weather pattern so that it made Alaska much warmer than normal. But where there's a push, there's a response. And the response was that the jet stream over the United States took a much more southern dip and it actually brought cold Arctic air across our region. It's a global event. It's not warmer here, but it was certainly much warmer in another part of the world. And that's the problem we have with climate change, that it's about the average conditions. Some of us will experience warmer, some will experience colder, but the overall combination of warm and cold, the Earth will be much warmer. At the very core of climate science, it's understanding that climate change is here. It's happening now. But the timing and the magnitude and where it will happen in any particular location at any one time is still a forecast problem. And still there are some unknowns. And climate deniers really focus in on this because they will capitalize on the unknowns. 
and they will eventually convince the general public that scientists knows nothing about anything, that somehow we're, we're out there trying to falsify scientific information, and that's simply not true. Scientists themselves tend to be very skeptical. Their job really is to, to understand truth, and it's very hard because there is no book of all knowledge. So scientists come up with ideas and they vet them through what we call the scientific process. It's not good enough for a scientist to believe they are right. It's not good enough for a scientist to know they are right. Scientists must convince each other that they are right. And we do this through a process that does, has no expectation about the outcome of the ideas, but rather we remain loyal to the process. So what I, would, what I would add before we go into our panel discussion is many of the, the conversations we've had today about things that are happening worldwide, but you probably say, well, what about where I live? What's happening in my own backyard? I will tell you, in 1986, I, I uh, bought a home, and in, in, uh, my wife and I started it in, in Homer Glen, Illinois, and I was going to populate the grasses, the trees, the vegetation, the, everything that I could find that was native Illinois plants. It's now 30 years later. And of the 23 trees I put in my yard, I've had to cut five down. Austrian pines, um, green ash. I have a number of native plants that don't grow anymore. Um, so if you're into gardening and you're, in, and you're always looking at what zones buy plant gardens and seeds and you worry about why uh, tomato plants didn't do as well this year as they did last year or vice versa, these are things that actually are happening in our backyard now. So we might talk about that a little later on as well. It's in your backyard now if you go looking for it. Thank you, Doug. Our next panelist is Mary Gady. Mary Gady is currently the president of Gady Environmental Group, LLC, an international consulting firm that provides strategic advice on energy, climate, and environmental issues. She is an eminent environmental leader and lawyer in the Chicago area. From October 2006 until June 2008, Ms. Gady served as the Region 5 Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to her presidential appointment, she was a partner in the Environmental Practice Group of Sun and Shine, Nath, and Rosenthal in Chicago. Previously, Ms. Gady was the director of the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency under Governor Jim Edgar. During her eight years there, she was co-founder of the Environmental Council of the States. Ms. Gady also held other senior management positions at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in key areas such as emergency response, Superfund cleanup, and air quality. She served as the Deputy Assistant Administrator of US EPA's Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response in Washington, DC. In 2008, Ms. Gady was awarded the prestigious Richard Beatty Mellon Environmental Stewardship Award by the Air and Waste Management Association. Ms. Gady has a JD from Washington University School of Law. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Mary Gady. but I'm getting older because it gets longer and longer. <laughs> and the audience starts to go to sleep. Thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. And, and I have to say, it's always a delight to be with Tom Skilling, who oh. is a, such a star in this area, and such a leader in terms of carrying forth this message, which is so important. And Doug Sisterson, one of the leading scientists in this country, so it's always great to be with them. And plus, it means I don't have to prep as much, because if I have a question, I just turn to either of them. <laughs> So what I want to do quickly, and then allow a, a discussion, this, this, this um, session we're having this afternoon could not have come at a more significant and crucial time for the environment, and most particularly climate issues and climate prevention in this country. And so I'm really grateful that you are here, and I want to hear from you and get, answer your questions and participate. Um, first of all, I think that I don't need to frame for you after listening to Tom and to Doug the urgency and importance of this issue. I had the privilege of serving at the request of President Obama on the National Climate Assessment, and as he said two years ago when that report was released, climate change is real, it is here, it is now. 
And so I think we need to like, take it very seriously in terms of what we are doing both globally, um, nationally, and locally. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about. Before I do that, I want to highlight a couple of concepts that are key if you're looking at this from a regulatory or um, treaty kind of perspective, internationally, whatever. There are two overarching concepts when you're trying to address climate change. It can be addressed either by adaptation, which is responding to it and taking measures to try and prevent its worst outcome. It can be as simple as putting on a raincoat when it's raining. It can be building higher seawalls. It can be planting crops that are more drought resistant or heat tolerant or whatever. So it's adaptation. It's trying to like take, deal with the fact that it's happening and then mitigate and, and, and deal with the consequences of it. The second concept that's really key and the one that's been most problematic internationally and in this country is called mitigation. How do you actually slow down and prevent putting these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere so that you actually start pulling back uh, and not having the problem in terms of climate change? So mitigation is the one that's the most complicated. It's a little hard to argue with adaptation when you see something like Hurricane Sandy, like your slides are really telling, of course people are gonna go out there and strengthen infrastructure, make sure the electric grid is better and whatever, this stuff is happening right now. But to convince people that you need to mitigate, you need to stop putting these greenhouse gases <coughs> into the atmosphere has been very difficult. And I would say that Tuesday's election has not made it easier. So let me just, so that's one concept I wanna talk about. The other thing is we tend to focus when we talk about climate change only on carbon, that's sort of the, the narrative, you know, what are we going to do about carbon? There are other greenhouse gases, as I'm sure Doug will talk about. In fact, the U.S. EPA talks about six greenhouse gases, uh, methane, nitrous oxides, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. And that becomes important because some of these are actually worse in terms of their consequences for the environment than carbon, in terms of how long they persist in the environment and how much they trap heat. So it's important to talk about them. And then the third thing I just want to point out to you, here in the United States, where are we having, where's most of the, where, where are most of these greenhouse gases coming from? So where do we know, need to focus our efforts if we're going to actually pull back and, and try and stop this problem? Interestingly, until just about a couple of months ago, the main producer of greenhouse gases in this country was the electric generating sector. So from fossil fuels primarily, from coal and, and natural gas and so forth. Um, Oh, yeah, that was surpassed just recently by transportation. All of the SUVs we drive, all of the cars we drive, the increased use of air transport and so forth. So transportation is now the leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States within the last few months. So that is not to say that electric generation is not important, but it has actually switched places. Agriculture results in about 9% of our greenhouse gases. Industry takes up pretty much the rest. So those are sort of background concepts. What I'd like to do, because I really do want to get to the discussion, is tell you some of the stuff that's happening right now so that you have a frame of reference. And I know some of you, if you're here today, actually care about this deeply, may know more about it than I do. But let me share with you. Something really significant happened on last week on Friday, November 4th. The Paris Accord, the international agreement to address climate um, greenhouse gases and mitigate them, was actually entered into force. This is a document that was, um, comes out of the United Nations. It, you may have heard of the Kyoto Protocol. This was the predecessor agreement. It did not work all that well because what it did is forced industrialized nation, the nations to have to limit um, their greenhouse gases to a certain level. The United States <coughs> never ratified it and never was a party to it. Mm. And, and there was huge tensions between the developing world and the industrialized world about who was responsible and what were we were gonna do. So it was not a huge success. A year ago in Paris, at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the parties actually decided on a new international agreement. And this one, the goal is to do this. The goal is to prevent um, global temperatures from rising by two degrees centigrade, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, um, over pre-industrial levels, because this is the tipping point that these two gentlemen were talking about. The concern is that once you hit that kind of rise of temperature, <coughs> cannot turn back. These gases persist in the atmosphere for what, thousands of years, some of them? Longer. Longer. <laughs> Longer. And so once you get that much stuff up into the atmosphere, you can't take it out. And so you're just gonna have a heating effect no matter what you do. And then the other piece of this is, because it was very contentious at the Paris Agreements, people said, but even that's going to cause serious havoc in our, our, our societies. Um, we should like make best efforts to keep that level to 1.5 degrees centigrade. 
but there's great fear that that can't happen. So an Oxford report just came out recently that said if we build one more fossil fuel fire generating unit in 2017, we will start making it impossible to meet that level. 2017, where are we right now? In November of 2016. Okay, so that agreement is hugely important and the United States is a party to it. Um, strategically, the Obama administration decided and others in the world not to make it a treaty. It doesn't need Senate ratification and so the president himself signed on to it on behalf of the country. And it required 55 nations at least with 55% of the emissions um, of greenhouse gases to sign on to it. That was achieved in record time, less than a year when most of these agreements take four, five, six years, but that's the urgency the world feels on this. And so it came into effect, um, as I said, last Friday, and it's a huge, important thing. The United States' commitment in it is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 26% by 2025, over 2005 levels, and 80% by 2050. It's, pretty, it's a lot. It's a lot for us to do, but that's important. And equally importantly, China, the world's biggest producer of greenhouse gases, were second. In fact, U.S. and China are 38% of global emissions of, of greenhouse gases. They made a commitment that by 2030, they will replace their fossil fuel generation um, by some, I've forgotten the percent, but it's very large. It's more than the electricity that powers the entire United States. So you've got significant contributions by people. And as opposed to forcing them to, to, to pick, um, to, to meet a certain level, it's bottom up. It's saying to the nations of the world, we expect you to be ambitious, but tell us what your national contribution is going to be based on your own, your own um, capabilities and your, your place, you know, in terms of what's going on with your country. And so there is a much greater sense that this may work, but it's like much more problematic because there's nothing mandatory about it. It is not binding. So that's that going on. Even as we speak right now in Marrakesh, Morocco, <coughs> the next session, a year later, the, the United Nations meets yearly on this at the Conference of the Parties. And they were supposed to be working out, and I'm sure they are, some of the logistical details about how to implement that agreement. Of course, right in the middle of that, we've had our election, and so there is much, much distress in Morocco in terms of what's going to happen going forward. Here in the United States, the key piece of legislation that the, um, it's not legislation, excuse me, regulations that President Obama put forth through the EPA is called the Clean Power Plan. The Clean Power Plan is important because it's our first national legislation to ratchet down on greenhouse gas emissions from the electric sector, from existing plants in the electric sector. And what it essentially does is set up statewide limitations. Every state has their own based on a whole host of very complicated things that will we'll bore you to death and I'm not going to talk about. But essentially it requires if, that if all the states did what they were supposed to under the Clean Power Plan, which is uh, which I'll talk about in a minute what's going on with it, we would have a 32% reduction in greenhouse gases um, over, 2005, over 2005 levels by 2030. It would be a huge contribution to the United States <coughs> meeting its goal under this new Paris Accord. A key thing about it. The important thing to know about it, it's in litigation. The DC Circuit just heard the arguments on it in September. There's been a whole host of very strange kind of things happening in the courts. The Supreme Court did something it almost never does um, and stayed the EPA from taking any action to implement it until it goes all the way through the court system. This almost never happens. And then has said that the EPA cannot implement it until all appeals, including up to the Supreme Court, are done. And so this makes, and we'll talk about it in a minute, the filling of that last job on the Supreme Court, the vacancy by Justice Scalia, hugely important. Then the last, there's two other things I want to mention. So I said there are other greenhouse gases besides the ones I've, that have that, been that carbon. Something really important and good just happened in October in um, Kigali, Rwanda. Um, the countries of the world came together and decided that they were going to regulate hydrofluorocarbons, which are um, the chemicals that are used in refrigeration, foam insulation, air conditioning units, and so forth. Um, they're very, very powerful greenhouse gases. You have well, actually, they're, more, they're actually a compound that gets into the atmosphere, and, and actually, by their very nature, for one molecule of these uh, CFCs, you can destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. That's where the problem comes into play. So, so they're very powerful, and that's what I'm saying. With our focus on carbon, we must not lose sight of these other things. But this is very exciting. It's an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And you may remember back in the 80s when we were all freaking out about the fact that there was a hole in the ozone layer, yeah. it, right? That, 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 that UV light was going to come in and we were all like wearing copious quantities of sunscreen, right? Well, 
1987, once again, countries of the world came together and decided to regulate the greenhouse gas, or excuse me, not the greenhouse gases, the, the yeah, hydrofluorocarbons. No, I don't hydro. CFCs. 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 Um, and by doing that, they, this is interesting because it's the, one of the biggest success stories in terms of an international treaty ever, and especially in the environmental arena. And it tells you that things like the Paris Agreement can succeed. It's an incredible rest lesson. So the reason you're not hearing about that anymore, it's not because the news media got tired of it. It's because by putting in place in 1978 limitations banning the use of the, for both production and consumption by manufacturers, um, we no longer have the problem. Yeah, in fact, a report came out yesterday saying that the ozone hole for the first time had not grown over Antarctic or we're saying it, 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 at its peak time it was not, didn't cover any larger amount of terrain that it did. So, yeah, so anyway, so I mean, it, it, it tells you when people say you can't do anything about these kinds of issues, you can. I want to highlight something in Illinois and then I'm going to flip. Um, David, I'm going to talk a little briefly about the agenda of President-elect Trump. No. Uh, I think for all of you in, uh, that are in this room today, you will want to follow what's happening in the Illinois General Assembly during the veto session, which is starting next week. There is a job it's called the Clean Jobs Bill because it creates 20, 32,000 um, clean energy jobs in Illinois annually if it's it passed. It has provisions that will substantially make Illinois a climate and um, clean energy leader in the country in terms of renewables, energy efficiency, and so forth. But recently, Exelon has factored into the bill, and like, like a Christmas tree as you add things to it, wants a bailout for their nukes in downstate Illinois that will cause a fairly hefty electric, uh, electricity surcharge for everyone in the state. So they're seeking between 200 and 265 million dollars a year to keep two of their nuclear plants running. So, and then Dynagy, the big coal produced, the coal generating facilities in southern Illinois, not up here, um, they also want a subsidy. So I'm just saying, whether this goes forward and the good stuff comes out, hard to say, but you will want to follow it as consumers, I think, as it goes forward. All right, so let's flip. Um, all of the assumptions, so you can see the world has been like really focused on climate and starting to do some terrific things, including in the United States. All of that may have changed on Tuesday. Um, so what I wanted to do with you is rather than sort of, like, is just give you what, <coughs> what our president-elect has said himself, and then I will stop and we can go into a discussion about those issues that you want to talk about. So what I did, because I thought it would be the most um, honest, is I went through his Gettysburg speech that he gave recently, which is his discussion that he calls his contract with the American voter and his roadmap for what he will do during his first 100 days of pres as a president. And what I have done is pulled out from that the stuff that relates to climate, because it certainly covers many things, such as Obamacare and immigration and the wall and you know, in the southern part of the US. Okay, so what he has said is that on the first day of his presidency, he will implement measures to deal with honesty, accountability, um, and change in D.C. The first is that he will put a hiring freeze on federal government employees, except for the military, public safety, and public health. What the implications are, we do not know in terms of the EPA. Um, he has also said uh, that for every new regulation, two, must, two regulations must be eliminated. And in another speech, he has said that, that will be, he wants to see 70% of the regulations that are currently out there eliminated. He then also said, um, and by the way, that would probably count, include things like this regulation, the Clean Power Plan that I just talked to you about, which is so key, a cornerstone of our US contribution to re reducing them. On the first day, he wants to take seven actions to protect American workers. He wants to withdraw from NAFTA, which by the way, has some significant environmental provisions. Um, two, he wants to lift restrictions on the production of $50 trillion of job-producing American energy reserves, including shale oil, natural gas, and clean coal. In other words, drilling off the off offshore drilling and drilling on public land. Um, third, he wants to lift the Obama-Clinton roadblocks to allow vital infrastructure projects like the Keystone Pipeline. Um, Four, he wants to cancel the billions of dollars in payments to the United Nations climate change programs to use the money to fix America's infrastructure. Additionally, on the first day, he has proposed five actions to restore security and the constitutional rule of law in this country. He wants to cancel every unconstitutional or illegal executive order, plan, or action by the Obama <coughs> administration. 
And that will include something that's really key to the United States approach to deal with climate, which is the Climate Action Plan, which is done by an executive order of President Obama. Two, he wants to begin the process of selecting a replacement for Justice Scalia from a list of 20-some judges. Uh, this list, there's actually two lists, but one was prepared by the Heritage Foundation, an exceedingly conservative think tank in Washington, D.C. And then, next, he wants to work with Congress to introduce legislation to measure and fit uh, to fight for their, their passage in the next 100 days. So these are things that he said, I'm gonna, I need Congress to do this for me because of how they're structured. Um, it includes things like Obamacare, tax relief, uh, building the wall, and so forth. So he, what he wants to do is create uh, the American Energy and Infrastructure Act, which leverages public and private partnerships and private investments through tax incentives to spur $1 trillion in infrastructure investment over 10 years. And then finally, Tom referenced but another thing which was not part of his 100-day plan, but certainly for all of us who are following the news, he is looking at some really critical appointments for the Department of Energy, Department of Interior, the US EPA, and other places that will actually very much influence where his administration is going. And so all of the things I have just proposed to you will have ripple effects in the world, if not tsunami effects, and we should talk about them as you're interested. Thank you, Mary. That was... Uh, I'm just going to talk, wanted to touch on a couple of things. There are so many things to, that we could talk about, uh, but I kind of want to get a dialogue going. And so to the speakers, all of these are, they're, they're free game for anybody who wants to jump in and, and provide comments. And everything. I guess the first one is, is there a better term we could be using than climate change? I mean, change is good. Well, um, thank you. Um, this is a change direction. <laughs> Now, there actually is in the scientific community, we're having a hard time trying to find the right socialization of the word to make, to make it more understandable to the general public. So we started out with global warming, and that was just warming the atmosphere. We can see that some other, other things happen as a result of that. It's become sort of in the last uh, 10 years, maybe, climate change. But climate change, my wife is a preschool teacher, and, and, and we always focus on not all change is bad. Well, well, this is a bad one. So, so we need something else. And I guess it was uh, in the Obama administration that was the, the term is becoming uh, very, very nice with the scientific community. It's called climate disruption. It's extremely disruptive. And, um, and recently, that's sort of the, the word that's being used. But we probably have to go back to our social scientists and try to come up with a word that uh, maybe hits a little bit closer to the general public. But right now, it's climate disruption. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, as Mary pointed out, we have made some progress in, in, regula in the regulatory area and through uh, in the courts and through uh, these, these international agreements. Can you uh, share with me your thoughts on how durable do you think these, yeah. these programs and these, these efforts are? I think that's, you kind of pointed out some disturbing quote, quotes, but uh, what is the ability of Trump administration to actually act on these types of, of, of issues? So the ability of the Trump administration is significant. These, uh, there, there are some impediments, obviously. And by the way, can I just point out to you that there are checks on everything in this system, including, most importantly, the people in this room and voters. And so in two years, we'll have mid-year midterm elections, and there will be another opportunity to come back and revisit who, who is carrying what messages and what's happening. But let me quickly say what's happened. The Paris support, the Paris Agreement, excuse me, is incredibly important as you can tell because now we have, oh by the way, so the UN has a site that you can check and so just two days ago I went on to see how many countries have now ratified it and so they are committed to it. 103 out of the 197 in the world. And it's like every day there are more of them. So I'm just saying it is a huge, you know, important thing. The United States participation is key. That's one of the things that's why Kyoto never took off because people said if the country at that time, the world's biggest emitter, will not be part of this, then why should we? Why should we have our economy deal with these issues and so forth? So all that uh, President um, Trump has to do, remember this isn't a treaty, it wasn't ratified by the Senate. There's a provision, we are now legally a party to it, and, but all he has to do is wait three years and then notify them, and one year after that, within four years, we can be out of it. It's not binding, so in the meantime, he need not do anything. 
and it's, it, it comes out of another agreement called the United Nations, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that we signed in 1992. All he has to do is like, withdraw us from that, which takes one year. So there is nothing binding him whatsoever to meeting the, the Paris Agreement and our commitment. In terms of the Clean Power Plan, as I said to you, not surprisingly, because it regulates the coal-fired uh, you know, and natural gas-fired utility industry, there are 20-some challenges against it by states like West Virginia, Indiana, where Vice President Pence comes from, um, other industries like Marie Cole, uh, who are challenging it. That is playing its way through the court system. Um, an incoming president, because this is a regulation, even though it's been promulgated, so it's actually law, it's just being challenged, could actually go in during, before this, this it's heard, um, not finalized, could go into court and ask for a voluntary remand and say, we want to relook at it. There are a lot of judgments made in it in terms of whether there were reasonable costs, whether it was, you know, we use the right the appropriate technical considerations. We want to rethink it given the litigation. So we could seek a voluntary remand. He could wait until the court acted, and then because it's a regulation, have his EPA say, well, we're going to like propose a counter regulation, and we're going to weaken the limits, we're going to rescind it, we're going to whatever. There will be court challenges, but once again, very easy for him to step back from it. And then finally, as I said, because the Congress has been so unwilling to do anything on climate change, President Obama, who has been very committed to a legacy of dealing with this issue, has used his executive authority. And all of that is reversible on day one, merely by yet another piece of paper that says, I, you know, I, this executive order cancels that executive order. And the Climate Action Plan is the centerpiece of President Obama's um, program to do this. It was out, in, came out in 2013. It's the reason we have a clean power plan. It's the reason we're, rep we're uh, regulating methane gases. It's why we're doing infrastructure improvements for Hurricane Sandy, and it's why we're participating internationally. And so the answer is, the short answer is, it, it may be a little complicated, but it's not impossible to overturn many of the things that we thought were moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, coal, because you mentioned that, but also renewables. I mean, can the coal industry really be revived? I mean. Didn't natural gas displace coal quite a while ago due to economics, not so much environmental issues? And, um, you know, isn't it, I, I think I read recently that uh, there were more clean energy jobs created in the last year than in the non renewable energy sector. So, it, aren't some of these processes, isn't it hard to turn back those? those those activities that are happening in our economy and driven by markets as much as regulatory. Right, so out of the, kind of outside of the box of science, but the issues I heard on NPR, that there are actually more workers now producing solar cells or solar panels than there were coal miners. Wow. Um, so, so um, and you can go to Home Depot and you can buy a solar panel now that at least We'll give you, a, you know, 45 watts of power to heat up a, a lamp in your backyard. So, um, yeah, there, there are things moving forward. So, the president has talked about creating more coal jobs, but the coal industry has not been impacted by regulations, as Doug just said. It really is by the market forces. So, with the flood now of natural gas, because we now have unconventional oil production with fracking and so forth, and now our the largest producing oil, oil and natural gas producer in the world. Um, with, with that, the prices have really come down. So I called a friend of mine and said, what's going on at the Henry Hub, which is where you do natural gas pricing? Natural gas was $2.68 yesterday. They think it's gonna be over a year before it goes up to $3. That means that it's like, it outprices, it, it's so much cheaper than coal. There is no way to go forward building burning coal. And so these jobs are not gonna come back. And Hillary Clinton had a plan in which she was going to actually sort of do $30 billion to, to coal miners, to educate them and train them recognizing that this industry is not coming back. Now let's not forget that probably methane is probably one of the most uh, dangerous greenhouse gases. So when we're talking about natural gas, we're talking about methane. It's so going to coal to methane doesn't exactly solve the problem. And, and that, by the way, one quick aside. Methane is the cleanest, or natural gas is the cleanest burning fossil fuel, but the operative word is burning. If it leaks, it's, one, it's a potent greenhouse gas, 84 times more potent than carbon over a 20-year lifetime. So one of the things we have to do is make sure as we do all of this drilling that the entire oil and gas supply chain 
We're capturing gas when we drill new wells. We're not letting leaks from the distribution system here under your streets. I don't know where you're getting your gas from, the North Shore or something. You have to make sure that those, those leaks are captured. Yeah, I read somewhere that uh, they think just put the pipeline alone that a lot of the methane release is like in the order of 15% just by leaking. You know, what's interesting too, I, we did a piece over at Argonne, uh, I visited with Seth Darling. Seth is uh, in the, working in the arena of nano uh, technology. Uh, he envisions uh, in the future windows that will be embedded within the little nano uh, collector uh, through which we'll look at the outdoors as we do now, but they'll actually be solar collectors. You can embed these in driveways, sidewalks, streets, uh, you know, and, uh, everywhere else. And this is the kind of work that's going on in our national laboratories. Another point to be made. Why are we letting the French and the Chinese uh, corner these markets? I mean, the jobs of the future are going to be in these new generation fuels. We as a country have always been a leader in these technologies. I mean, our space program, every little device we walk around with today is a product of the miniaturization that went on with the space program and everything, everything else. So there are all kinds of offshoots from federal investment in research that come. and. Seems to me we ought to be producing the wind vanes you see out on our farms uh, instead of the French and or the Germans, and we ought to be uh, developing the solar panels instead of some of that being done over in uh, China. And uh, this is where our government can see the, the industries that will employ in the future and make us a leader uh, in these areas, uh, and, and at the same time uh, affect our environment constantly. So, uh, one more point, though, because it's back to you know, what, what's going on with renewables. So in the United States in 2014, it was the first time that with subsidies, there's, this is a controversial issue, that there's tax subsidies for renewables, the wind production tax credit and the investment tax credit for solar. They are being phased out and will end in 20, 2020 and 2021. But for the first time in 2014, um, wind and solar with the subsidies were the least expensive fuel in America to generate electricity. And in Europe, um, in um, the UK and in Germany, they are currently the least expensive form without subsidies. And there are now examples throughout the world in the last couple of years in which whole cities and countries have run for a couple of days at a time just on renewables. Wow. It's uh, fascinating that there's been a new science of emerging science with economic science. And it's been actually pretty interesting to watch how um, to put it in, in terms that it's palatable to us is that if you were to take all of the natural disasters that, that occur due to climate change, which in, in 2015 was $160 billion, okay? if you take all those, all the federal subsidies um, and all the trade regulations and all these types of things, and you were to lump all the health issues associated with the burning of fossil fuels, and you put that at a price tag at the gas pump and put it in one place that everybody could see, the estimate is that the cost of a gallon of gas would be well over $15 a gallon. So that means to fill up an average car would be over 300 And that's a conservative estimate. Yeah. So if you want to put apples to apples and oranges to oranges about renewables and so forth, let's, let's put it on a level playing field. That, that's fantastic. Um, and it's wonderful to, to there are some silver linings yeah. in, some, in some of these clouds. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. What is the one thing you want to teach Donald Trump about climate disruption and climate change? <laughs> if you could get his attention for five minutes. That's happening. Oh, yeah. just, uh, just, uh, what's that? You should do that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom, I don't know. Tom, 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 talking about issues that seem so political, um, and yet, unfortunately, the people that make our policies are politicians. So uh, you get into this, but I, uh, and you've got to, because we've got to watch what's being done in our name. But I'm serious, this book was terrific. Um, this takes on, because, you know, when you talk to somebody, first thing they want to do is they want to get a debate going, and they'll be all over you and all the rest, but I mean, um, they'll throw out certain things like, we've always had climate change, or uh, we're gonna lose jobs if we do this and then destroy our economy, or stuff like that. And this book, even uh, one of the things I found so interesting about this was, 
because it's uh, you know, the work in our time, you guys understand the new technologies that are being worked on and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it was fascinating to see you talk about uh, this. Yeah, we also look for solutions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's it's a silver lining there. It's not all gloom and doom. It, it, it isn't an all doom and gloom story, you know, if we if we approach it the right way. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the most, the most important thing that I feel in passion as a, as a researcher is that I, it's, science is not political. Science is the sort of the quest for truth. There is no book of all knowledge. No, there isn't. And so the idea is it, 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 it has to be what we can convince each other is true. That becomes sort of, of, of consensus. And, and the hard part is for us is we, we slave away, uh, not just meteorologists and climate scientists, but, but think of all the things in the world that we have now because of science. Yeah. And, and for me, what we're hoping is, I'm not a politician. I have no clue how to, how to take the science we know and, 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 and put it in terms of a policy that makes a, a fair sense. But boy, oh boy, I, I would hope that policymakers look towards the science for its source of information. It, it really is amazing. I feel like there's a sense that uh, uh, the climate scientists are cashing in on all this grant money. I always like to ask, uh, you know, I ask Doug whether he's in a yacht or uh, you know, something like that. You got a nice suit. And I, I asked Don he's Wiggles. got a few less trees. And a lot less trees. I, I had uh, Don Wiggles, who, from the University, he, he's one of the lead authors, or has been, of this uh, international IPCC UN reports on the state of the climate. So he said, Don, are you compensated for your work? He said, no. And I said, are any of your scientists uh, no, he said everybody is there. Their institutions allow them time to do it, but they're not paid directly to produce these reports. So this notion that there's some sort of monetary bonanza in all this is wrong. Um, and I think that's important to tell the public because I think people realize that uh, or think that there might be uh, some monetary gain that these folks are realizing by taking a particular stance on the subject. It's not true. And secondly, what Doug, what, uh, Doug has said, I've met a lot of climate scientists. I, they are the most apolitical people I've ever run into. Um, and and uh, that's why when we do these things, when we do Fermi Lab, when we do a forum like this, I think it's important for the public to actually meet the scientists who are doing research. They're an impressive group of human beings. I mean, very bright. And also, you realize that there isn't some sort of, we've gotten kind of political here just because we had an election this year. Uh, this week, and we also have real ramifications for this election for the people we hear that are being appointed in these positions. But the fact is, most climate researchers I've talked to have no uh, political uh, leanings. I can read right off the top of the band, you know, right, right off the uh, right of my hand, and then just be. You know, I, I think that's right. I mean, science, uh, the, the process of science, the scientific method is inherently conservative. You're yeah. testing the null yes. hypothesis. You're not. And it's brutal. And it's brutal. It is brutal. I mean, uh, this peer review process that scientists go through, this is why it's it's something to say that 97% uh, of the scientists are on board with this. To get 97% of this group that would kill in some cases, um, you know, I, the, the I, I, peer I think review process is really mean. It's, 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 it's <laughs> tough. <laughs> it's really but, tough. But just to put it in perspective, if you really want to wrap your brain around it because there is no book of all knowledge, a theory exists not because you can prove it right. It exists because you can't prove it wrong. No one can prove it wrong. So what the vetting science process is to put out good ideas till you get one that nobody can prove hey, wrong. Ted Fujita, the famous tornado researcher, to the day he died, I used to talk to him, he would bring up the fact he's the one who put forth the concept of a microburst and downburst. He was wounded till the day he died by the reaction of his peers in the sort of meteorological community that he came up with this concept that there's air that gushes down from clouds and creates these wind shear situations that crash planes. And when he came out with that observation and that speculation that that's really what was going on, and he pretty well proved it, that people said, you are crazy. And they, they absolutely call him crazy. And, and that really wounded him. I mean, that hurt him because uh, he had to then go out and prove it. And now everybody accepts it. It's like it's second nature. And yet when that uh, uh, theory was put across, uh, that description of the mechanics of uh, the storm 
wind damage and wind shear plane crashes. Uh, you know, I, people refuted, refuted it. So scientists, to get people on board with this notion that humans are having an impact on climate change hasn't happened overnight. It's been a long, brutal process with a lot of scientists putting their names on the line and then having to prove to their peers that what they had to say about it is really going on and happened. That's, that's great. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the strategies about sequestration of carbon, either through engineered means or through um, uh, forests and forest protection or forest propagation. I like this one because uh, I have a forestry background. And so um, any, I'll just throw that out for in, into the group to see, are there any magic bullets out there? Well, I wish there was. You know, science, my grandfather was, was, was kind of taught me that money is like manure. You got to spread it around to do any good. And science is a lot of that, that way too. And I can put all our eggs in one basket. And there are certainly all kinds of ideas um, for, for mitigation, you know, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, biofuels, a lot of these things. The, the problem is, is it, with, with all of these things is to scale them up to some level that they can be implemented with the current infrastructure. And there's cost for each of these. And I know there's a lot of science going on in each of these areas to, to see what's, what do we, if we understand the physics of it well enough to know that it's a, a viable, uh, meaningful solution. You know, well, I'm sorry, I, I was just saying, we've done a couple of reports with the folks at the Botanic Garden. It's interesting, they do some research there. And by the way, that's the, um, they house Northwestern University's, uh, uh, what, horticultural department. Uh, there, but uh, they're looking, for instance, at which grasses, uh, natural native grasses that we can grow around here, absorb the most carbon dioxide. Now, you know, as Dutch says, it's a scaling issue, but I mean, it's little stuff like that that, you know, cumulatively can have an impact, and uh, it's natural, and uh, it's well worth looking into. Well, I, I think that's a great segue into, uh, got a lot of questions coming in, and such as what can the public do beyond their own homes or in their own homes to support good policy, but but let's just talk about lifestyle and, and things like that. It, can we can we move the needle uh, by 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 doing any any of these changes? And I think you, you touched on SUVs. I don't you know. Somebody asked me when I was at a Benedictine University. They said, "All right, hotshot, what kind of vehicle do you drive?" And I drive a, a, a Wrangler, which. You know, and I explained the reason I drive that. I only go to work and come home every day, but I've got to get to work in a snowstorm. And so I need a vehicle to get through that. And I, I drove a little Honda Civic for a long time and a, a little little car that was much easier on the gas. But um, I I can't tell you the number of times that I couldn't get through a snowbank, you know, when it snowed. But, um, yeah, I mean, we. I kind of. I try to turn off lights. I, I was at a meeting just like this. It was an English woman voters that was smoking in Naperville, and there was a gentleman in the back that came up and, and and pointed out that there had been some research done. So, but I'm going to save the best for for Mary. <laughs> yeah, hang on. You're going to clean up on this. Trust me. <laughs> so the issue the issue was what could the general public do? You know, so so there were there were three things um, that they claimed had, had had showed up in reports. One is that the most um, significant factor to climate would, would be the car that you choose, that you buy and drive on the road. Your choice. This, well, it's not always your choice. The second thing would be is the energy efficiency of your house. Okay, so you would like to, to, to get it so it's tight enough um, that, that the, to efficiently heat it and cool it without making it unsavory for breathing inside the house. Oh, was the second biggest thing. And the third thing was that you, you used energy efficient appliances and you know, turned out the lights. But I would say that, that the number one thing that you could do is, is that I've been told, is political will. I don't know if I can say it better. This is really true because what you're talking about is adding and adding more pollutants into the atmosphere that persist there for a very long time. 
And so it is cumulative, and your actions actually do matter. And that is why transportation has now overtaken elect the electricity sector, yeah. quite honestly. There was an interesting study uh, report that came out in the New York Times last week that actually tells you how much like a single flight adds to the, the carbon problem. And, and, and so that you really can go online and check your carbon footprint. So all of the things Doug said, these are not just sort of like will make you feel good. They actually cumulatively, collectively, will have an impact. And and I, you know, I'm big on political will. I've spent much of my life in government, and I know how important it is when people speak. And you need to speak. You need to sort of keep abreast of this and walk. You know, make sure people understand the issues and go to the polls. But I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to do the things he's talking about. And by the way. I, just to be sure about what was going on, I checked on the rebate programs in Illinois that are being offered by ComEd and whatever they're mandated to do that, all the electric companies are by current legislation in Illinois. So if you wanted to do a geothermal system in your backyard, you could do it, $6,000 rebate. You want to put a new energy efficient air conditioner in, $300 rebate. I'm saying there is like money to be gotten to do some of these things. They will come out and do free assessments in terms of how to weatherproof your house, deal with like leaks from your attic, do them. I mean, if you actually care about this, that's not nonsense. That's real. Those are great, great ideas. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I do have a question about, you know, what will what will be happening to EPA under this new administration? What's going to be happening to Argonne? And, and I have a I have a little experience with this. I think I met Mary in 1982 when I was, I was in law seven. school. <laughs> She was a very young attorney at the, and, and was a, a mentor to us all. But I got the job as a law clerk because the Gorsuch, the Reagan Gorsuch administration had fired about 50 EPA attorneys. And so they hired a bunch of law clerks for eight bucks an hour, which was a great, 1982, I thought I was really happy with that. And, and I got to handle cases that were, uh, had been previously handled by EPA attorneys. And so, what 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 do you see? Uh, it's Larry and Doug. Uh, uh. Well, let me tell you this. Uh, but it has to be disassembled, you know, revoked that charter by the U.S. Uh, Congress, and I don't see that happening. So I'm not very worried about that. The bigger fear is, and it, and you are correct, and David, in terms of the Reagan administration is a good model for this. It was um, Ann Gorsuch Burford and Jim Watt at Interior. There was a concerted effort to try and like derail environmental protection and protection of the park lands and public lands. Um, it, it, what happened then is going to happen now. There was a citizen outcry. There was like um, legal um, abilities to block this in terms of the laws. For example, if, if some of the things that the president-elect has said he'd like to do will require 60 votes in Congress, whether he can get that with only 51 Republicans <coughs> to be seen. So there's a lot of those sort of things, but do not ever underestimate the importance of the, the citizen outcry. One of the things that brought, you know, that got Jim Watt kicked out early and, and Ann Gorsuch Burford, and I was there at the agency. We actually had a list. We had, I have a t-shirt somewhere with all the names being crossed off as they were being booted out of the administration. <laughs> it's probably crumbling now, but I have it. <laughs> but, but I mean, it was because there was such a hue and cry about it. And I think too that in science, I mean, sure, we, we read the headlines and we get nervous that a place like Argonne or Fermi National Lab or, or the other dozens of, of uh, national laboratories around the United States, sponsored by Department of Energy, by NOAA, by others, that the, if you look at the very basic premise for those laboratories, is to do the basic fundamental applied research to national problems not just climate, all kinds of problems. And so that's where I believe that the truth and the understanding of science comes from. It comes from the funding of those, those labs and, and what they do. And in the past, um, those labs have withstood um, uh, political turning of the winds. And, and, and so I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to get us through a, a, another period like that. However, the joke around the coffee pot, scientists do have a sense of humor, um, is, is that for our particular program, it's called the ARM Climate Research Program, uh, maybe we might think about calling it the, the ARM uh, Long and Other uh, Study <laughs> yeah, um, Facility rather than the, and, and Climate. But, uh, but, I, but I do believe that in the, in the end, the fundamental knowledge, everything that we learn about technology, all of it, 
comes from doing science, and I don't think science is going to disappear. Yeah. Uh, fails to implement its its uh, Paris Accord obligations. Does the Paris Accord continue? Do you think, or will are we a, are we a necessary component to this? We are. Yes, I mean, there's been a lot of articles about it this week by a lot of people that I respect. Uh, and, and clearly, it will, the, the rest of the world is saying we will go forward. But whether they're as ambitious in their goals, and as I said, the original goals, because they're actually decided, but may not get more aggressive. Um, people have suggested that China will take over, and back to the, if, by implementing these kind of things to, to do the greenhouse gas emissions where you're focusing on clean energy and energy efficiency and whatever, and creating jobs. The yeah, suggestion may be that if the U.S. backs out of this and doesn't do anything in a meaningful way, China will become the world leader and reap all the economic benefits. Just like you were talking about them making all the solar screens right. and stuff right now. If we back off, we are going to miss this window to be world leaders in terms of this space, and there's a lot of like, consequences for that. Yeah. So. No, and, and I think that's a, uh, uh, I think we're, it's about 6 o'clock, and we're going to have to bring this to a conclusion. And, uh, I did want to make the announcement that uh, Tom's presentation, Doug's, Doug's Phil, they will be available. One it will be rebroadcast on uh, Lake Forest TV, but these will be available on the League of Women Voters Lake Forest Lake Bluff website. And so, um, and I think Doug has some books that he might sell you. Um, I'm a poor scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Go we'll buy an SUV. <laughs> yeah. 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 So with that, um, I want to thank you yeah. 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 and um, stay active, vote. It really counts. Elections matter. speakers, Tom Skill and Mary Gady and Doug's sister. So we're so grateful for you participating today. We're so grateful for your attendance. And I want to remind people that it, you can not only uh, see this on Lake Forest TV, but you may go to lwv-lflb.org, our website, and not only will Tom's slides and Doug's video be posted there, but the entire program will be available through on through a link on our website to the YouTube recording of this. So tell your friends, tell your families, if this is an issue that uh, matters to you, we encourage you as the League of Women Voters to contact your legislators and the administration about your concerns. You've learned a lot today. We're so grateful. Thank you and have a great evening.